Hi, my name is Samantha Beats. Welcome to the webinar. I'm so happy to have you here. I'm a regional director and BCVA here at Cayo. Thank you so much for joining in. It's definitely a pleasure to have you here. And so today we're going to be talking about how to have fun and create those learning opportunities through everyday activities. So just a quick little recap in case you're unfamiliar with CAIO. So our CAIO team does consist of approximately 500 professionals, including BCBAs, mid-level supervisors, registered behavior technicians, and our collective admin team, scheduling and client services. And we do provide ABA therapy in home, center-based, and via telehealth. So what does that really compose? Obviously the direct therapy, parent training and consultation, behavior consultation, and the school and community shadow and support. So Kaya's getting bigger. We're currently servicing six different states with a few more being added to the list that we're mostly in all of the states on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, and more recently in Utah, Arizona, Texas, which we have multiple locations in Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, and Houston. And then we've also been in Colorado for about a year and a half. So very exciting. So we're here today to learn about those natural learning opportunities. So what does that actually look like? So quick peek at today's agenda. We'll start with exploring naturalistic teaching. What does it mean? What does it look like? Then we'll talk about how we can contrive natural learning opportunities within play. After that, we'll discuss some ways in which setting up the environment can assist in creating that, those learning opportunities. And I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box throughout for any questions which can pop up, but please know that I'll also have a, a section dedicated at the end of the webinar for some Q&A if we have any. So let's get started. First up, naturalistic teaching. What is it? So naturalistic teaching, it's really capitalizing on the child's interest, their motivation, and capturing those in the moment opportunities for us to actually teach them something, for them to interact or engage with their environment, with the people in it, or with something in it. So some examples really quickly, um, a child enjoys playing with trains. So you might work on prepositions, adjectives, following directions, you know, let's move the train along the track. Hey, can you give me the blue train? Or which train do you want? Do you want the red train, green train, or do you want the big one or the small one? Uh, cars, same thing. You can work on following directions. Hey, follow me. Oh, let's go on the street. If you're playing with a little kitty floor mat, maybe. Um, listener skills. So let's get the red truck and put the green and the blue cars on the back of that truck. Um, and naturalistic teaching, it's relatively newer. It's definitely a development within the field of ABA, kind of transitioning away from those typical discrete trial opportunities, which definitely do have their time and place, but it's really trying to look at following that child's lead, following their interests. And sometimes, yeah, the adult might take the lead within naturalistic play, or we're kind of thinking two steps ahead of the child in terms of what we can present to them to create a learning opportunity. But as I'm always talking to our families, you know, whatever the child is interested in, let's follow them. Let's try to find different learning opportunities for them with things that they're engaging with, things that they're interested in, as opposed to trying to force that learning upon them. And using naturalistic teaching can actually create some of that spontaneous communication because the things that we are using they're going to be interacting with all day long, all week long, throughout the summer. So they're going to remember what learning opportunities were presented to them when they were outside playing soccer with their big sister, with mom, with dad, grandma, grandpa. But the biggest thing about naturalistic teaching is we want to make it fun, right? Learning is supposed to be fun. We want it to be engaging. We want the child to be excited to learn. 
really we're doing our job with naturalistic teaching. It's a child is learning without actually being conscious of that they're being taught something in that particular, particular moment. Um, naturalistic teaching, you know, we want to follow some of those natural contingencies. So actually participating in the activity itself is reinforcing. So it could be their, their favorite painting set or their favorite Mr. Potato Head <laughs> um, set. There's all kinds out there now. Um, you know, it, learning within play is really the big piece. Um, maybe they enjoy playing with bubbles, all right? Let's, let's use that. Uh, one example, you know, a child who loves rockets and everything about outer space. So we're gonna pretend that we're flying in a rocket. We might have a, a toy rocket that we're going to fly to different planets. And oh, let's watch a video about these rock about this planet. Or if you're lucky to have pretend toy planets in their room, you can work on describing the planets. What do you think it's like to live there and try to get some interactions from the child on an area of interest for them? Okay, so now that we have a foundational understanding of what natural learning looks like, let's start talking about learning opportunities and what those actually are. So learning opportunities are everywhere, but before we get into it, let's like what exactly is a learning opportunity? So it's where we're encouraging the child to engage with us, their environment or something within it. So it's a chance to either learn a skill practice one that they are developing or to generalize a skill that they've already learned across different stimuli, different toys, different settings, or different people. But the trick with creating a learning opportunity is you want to balance that fun, active, engaged learning, pushing them a little bit so that they're encouraged to learn, but also avoiding that frustration or sometimes discouragement that students might feel in a typical quote unquote lesson. So how do we implement a learning opportunity? So in the picture, we're blowing bubbles. It can be as easy as that. You can work on eye contact. You can work on making requests for more, for bubbles. Oh, blow a bigger one. Um, you can have them imitate the actual action of blowing a bubble. Uh, you can call practice responding to name, calling their name, tapping them, or they might tap you on the shoulder or position yourself in that line of sight to get some eye contact and attention from them. For another example, for fine motor skills, you can set up the child's favorite painting set, coloring set, crayon set, and you can set up opportunities for them to paint, to color, to scribble, to maybe draw their favorite animal, and really work on that um, alligator grasp that we typically work on for writing or for painting. Um, you know, obviously, as soon as they are engaging in the response, right, so we've got something that they're interested in, we've got their intention, we're providing an instruction, you know, we're setting the stage for that learning opportunity, and as soon as they have emitted that response that we're looking for, if it's calling out for you, if it's labeling how big the bubble is, or what color they're painting with, if they're imitating the sweep of the paintbrush, you know, you want to provide that social praise and reinforcement for it. So, oh, good job. I really like how you're coloring inside the lines. Or, yeah, you're right. That was a huge bubble. Or, nice job getting my attention. Good job, little man. You know, you want to provide that social praise to try to encourage the child to demonstrate that same behavior again. Okay, so where do we find learning opportunities? So you must anticipate, I'm sorry for the noise in the background, you must anticipate what your child wants and will want in any given situation, but you can create these as well. So for example, your child loves their stuffed animals. Try naming the stuffed animals, you know, you line them up, name them and stop to see if the student will name the next one. And this can be done for any type of item that the child enjoys or has interest in. So trains, dinosaurs, model airplanes. Um, if the child enjoys reading a book, read a page and have them name the pictures. If the child loves dolls, have them label things that they're wearing or body parts 
as you're playing with them or as you're cleaning them up. Uh, your child enjoys playing video games or watching the latest TikToks. Have them maybe imitate the dance moves in the videos or label what they're doing within the video game. And can they anticipate what's going to come next in the game? Can they explain what they're doing and why? And going back to that earlier example of blowing bubbles, one time with a student, we set up a huge bubble machine in the backyard and we began pretending that we were ninjas. We were karate chopping them. Um, we were narrating our way through an adventure in this maze of bubbles. And we also used this to work on gross motor imitation fine motor for some of those smaller ones. But at the end of the day, learning was fun. I had fun, the kiddo had fun. And if you can, if you can take a little time to think create, creatively about creating a learning opportunity, it's really easy and you can get into the hang of it. So setting up the environment. So we definitely want to set up your child for success. You're, you've put all this effort and time into thinking creatively about learning opportunities that you can present or create for your child, different activities for them. So you want to set up and manipulate that environment so that it can be successful. Um, some quick examples, you know, you want to try to find activities for enforcers that you can dispense with pretty easy rather than remove. That way you're not having to leave the environment. You can also remove anything that you know will likely be a big distraction or might cause some distraction during the game. But I'm gonna go into some more strategies associated with the setting up or manipulating the environment that can actually create those natural learning opportunities. So manipulating the environment is a big one, but it can lead to lots of great learning opportunities for the kiddo. So for an example, to elicit requests for desired items or activities, you can put the items up on the shelves where the student can't reach them or maybe put them in closed, clear containers so they can see that it's there, but they're going to need some help or need to at least make a request to gain access to it. Um, you can also use tape or zip containers like food bags or containers that they might have to work on some fine motor skills to practice opening up themselves. Um, you know, if you've got things out of sight, um, they might actually want to ask for it. So an example, right, you're working with pen or you're trying to, the child's interested in coloring. You give them paper, but the crayons are up on the shelves. So they're going to have to come to you to ask for help to get the crayons or to ask for them themselves. Uh, say, for example, you're doing a puzzle, the child really loves puzzles, or you found the latest puzzle that they're super into, you know, a themed puzzle, uh, you can give them all of the pieces except maybe one or two, they accidentally get left in your pocket, but the child is completing this puzzle, there's a couple missing, they're going to ask a question, hey, where's my puzzle piece, or where's this piece, or look, this is missing, mom, can you help me find it? Or dad, can you help me? Do you know where they went? Um, you can also maybe provide a pencil that's not sharpened. So they have to ask for help to get it sharpened. Um, maybe you're playing a board game. Break the ice is one of my favorites. Um, you can set up the ice blocks, but where's the pick? We don't have it. Let's go looking for it. Is it under the table? Is it on top of the shelf? You know, you can try to incorporate some directions in there and situations that are naturally occurring. These are going to come up, but we've just spent a little bit of time to get ahead of that and create those natural opportunities. So different ways to incorporate naturalistic teaching, right? So these are just a few examples, but some pretty big ones. The first one is using learner-directed activities. So follow your child wherever they want to go. I know for my son, his room is, I don't know what the word is, but there are a lot of different toys, a lot of different books, action figures, academic workbooks, you know, big fire trucks, small fire trucks any dress up clothes, 
you, you go in there and there's an abundance of learning opportunities in there. If we were to play pretend or um, play with his tracks and we've got, he loves little Peppa Pig. So we might use Peppa Pig and put them in the fire truck and have him narrate a story. You know, there's so many different things. If you just follow your child and give them access to things that they enjoy doing, you can start to try to creatively think, okay, how can I get them to ask a question, to follow an instruction, to imitate something that I'm doing, um, you know, trying to follow, following their lead is probably the biggest part about naturalistic teaching. Um, you can also incorporate it within routine. So morning routine, right? We're, hey, we're going to get dressed and then you can set up for brushing teeth, but maybe put the toothpaste in an unusual place. So when they go to open up the door, get the toothpaste, it's not there. And you can give them the example of asking, hey, do you know where my toothpaste is or where did the toothpaste go? And then you can help them find it, but you're encouraging that question. Again, it kind of comes back to taking a puzzle piece out ahead of time. And we already talked about leaving things out of reach. Obviously they're visible, but they're inaccessible. So they have to ask you and they have to engage with you to get access to those things. Um, using a password, right? It's like a key. They have a specific password to unlock a fun activity that only you can provide. Sometimes I've had this where we put different activities, labels or pictures into a box. And then we, we're doing some work maybe at the table or we're doing a fun little learning opportunity and learning opportunity game. They do awesome. Here's a password. Let's, all right, let's go to the password box. Um, they give the password. It's usually with mom or dad or whoever the guardian is at the time. And then they get to go to the fun box and create different things for them or be able to access different things within there. Obviously planned activities, right? So you might set up a fun game, board game, uh, scavenger hunt. You know, there's so many different things that you could try to do. And then the gatekeeper is kind of what I mentioned earlier. You've got, you know, a box of toys, but um, each item that's in there, they have to ask for, or they have to ask for you to open, or they have to practice opening up a bag. So one time we had a box of things, they were all in little glad bags, some were the pull apart, some were zip, but those were skills that we were working on with the child for practicing and, and fine tuning some of their fine motor skills. So every time they were earning their reinforcer, they had another learning opportunity there where they just had to practice zipping or unzipping a bag to get this um, item that they had just earned. So just some key takeaways, if you're gonna take some other things away, language is huge. The more that you can talk, the more that you can narrate within play, the more language is just going to naturally get absorbed. That's just how we all learn language is by hearing it. So even if within play, um, say you have a very early learner, if you're able to just sit and play with them and narrate every action that you're doing, you're going to be able to draw upon that experience with the child when you're starting to teach them instructions. It's like, oh yeah, I heard heard Sophie use this term with this toy. Okay, I think they're related. Let me push it. Um, provide lots of choices. Child directed, you're following their lead, you're figuring out what is motivating for them, and you're incorporating it into your learning opportunities with them. And identifying learning opportunities and capturing it in the moment, it takes practice. You know, it's not something that you're just like, oh, well, great. You know, with this activity, I can do these five different learning opportunities, you know, but just kind of go with it, have that confidence in yourself that you know how to, and that you can do it. And you'll find that over time, it becomes a lot easier for you to capture those learning opportunities with your kiddo. Um, but biggest thing, be silly, be creative. That's, this is what I love about natural environment teaching and naturalistic teaching is we just get to have fun. You know, uh, kids go to school and they learn all day at the table. Let's be home with them. Let's hang out with them, follow their lead. Let's be goofy. You know, one of my favorite memories was um, pretending to be one of those Tinkerbell fairies um, on the pirate or the pirate ship. I forget the name of the movie, but that was one of my favorite ones because we were practicing adjectives, following instructions, you know, that motor imitation. 
um, the little kid was being so creative and asking all of these great questions like, where should we go next, Tinkerbell? You know, and just be creative. Kiddos learn so much when they're engaged with the adult or sibling that's trying to, to work with them. So here's another opportunity for some examples. Um, you're trying to work with the kiddo on receptive ID. You know, you can create a treasure hunt, scavenger hunt to have them find a list of items that are either hidden or strategically placed. You know, you might have a clue where they have to follow the instruction on the clue to find the item. Um, you can also use, you know, some form of gross motor bingo games um, where you might select, I know one time I had like a five by five grid with different um, actions on there. And I, it took a little of effort on the forefront, but we were able to create little flashcards, put our hand in, pulled one out, and then we just played bingo with it. Some were jumping five times, others it was um, pretending you were a snake, you know, trying to make it fun and creative and a little outside of the box. Um, kind of talks a little bit about video games. You can use prepositions, instructions, maybe during hide and seek, you can work on some of those greetings or practicing greetings, um, got, you know, motor imitation skills, you know, you can work on Simon Says, you know, Simon Says, put your hand on your head, Simon Says, wiggle your arms, Simon Says, jump up and down. Um, if you're painting, you can work on instructions like, hey, can you hand me the red paint? Or I, um, having them ask for which color they want to use next, you can do the motor imitation. Um, another favorite one is building a fort and having them build the fort using instructions. Oh, can you put this big box next to the red box? Or can you put the blanket on top? Um, so there's so many different fun activities that you can use. Um, as always, just put in here that if anytime you're wanting a behavioral consultation with the BCBA, you can go onto our website. We have a consultation page if you're wanting to talk with someone about different ideas for natural environment teaching or learning. That's what that's there for. Or if you have any questions about programming for your child or ABA services in general, you can definitely go on to our website and receive some free resources from there.